First of all, there was always the question of the army, what was its view on trade, uh, the Pakistani army. But I believe that currently, given Pakistan's economic situation, I believe the army will not be an issue. I don't think so. And by the way, it did not stand in the way either in 2010, 2011, when there were big moves. A thorny issue and is likely to create challenges for normalizing trade in the near future. But that said, sporting events have often been used as an opportunity to establish better relationships. And we've seen that in history on the Indian cricket team to reciprocate for the Champions Trophy in 2025 and I think that will be very crucial to again re-establish uh, relationships. Hello and welcome to Infer Talks, a podcast where I put you in the room with some of the biggest thought leaders from around the world. Today I'm joined by two distinguished economists to speak about the prospect of bilateral trade between India and Pakistan that are often in the news for bad patches in their relations. I have with me Dr. Adil Nakhora, assistant professor and research fellow at CBR at the Institute of Business Administration. And joining with me is Dr. Sanjay Kathuria, visiting senior fellow at the Center for Social and Economic Progress. Dr. Sanjay and Dr. Adil, welcome to Infer Talks. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. All right, Dr. Adil and Dr. Sanjay, let's start our conversation. And my very first question is, what do you really have to say about the kind of hiccups that actually come in the way of the two countries, India and Pakistan, from your respective perspectives, uh, when it actually comes to resuming or scaling up bilateral trade between India and Pakistan. Uh, so Dr. Sanjay, if we can start with you first, sir. Sure. <clears throat> so let's start with perhaps you know we we all obviously have to take things in a pre 2019 perspective because as we know in 2019 since 2019 trade has virtually stopped so from a pre 2019 perspective the what are the kind of obstacles that were faced <clears throat> the first of all uh, there was always the question of the army what was its view on trade uh, the pakistani army but I believe that currently, given Pakistan's economic situation, I believe the army will not be an issue. I don't think so. And by the way, it did not stand in the way either in 2010, 2011, when there were big moves to normalize trade between the two countries. So, so I think that is, uh, or, you know, a big deal is made of it, but I don't think uh, it's, the real, it's the real issue. So then we look at industry. Uh, you know, uh, in 2020, 2011, the industry lobbies, especially the automobile and the pharma lobbies, stood in the way uh, of several attempts to normalize trade. Some elements within the agriculture sector also uh, were not very comfortable with opening up, especially because they believed that, you know, big, big ticket stuff, like especially cereals, wheat were, could, could come in the way. But as we know from trade, uh, there are ways to ease pressures on sectors after trade liberalization. So I don't think from an economist perspective, those kinds of things are uh, insurmountable. I mean, they can be so what, what we call early harvest, for example, India, Sri Lanka, where India has given much more trade liberalization to Sri Lanka than the other way around. So there are ways to do uh, trade liberalization, which uh, ease the pressure for the weaker uh, economy. Once trade resumes, there will be many other issues to deal with. So I'm not going into those. You know, we, there are sensitive lists and land trade restrictions and transit trade restrictions and so on. So I think those are, uh, you know, a second set of issues once trade resumes. But I think uh, for me, uh, if you leave it to the country, if you were, I, I believe, if there was a, to be a vote in Pakistan, uh, I think the, it would be overwhelmingly positive in favor of trade for India. So what is currently holding back from a Pakistani side, I believe, is politics and optics, rather than uh, which is the main stumbling block, rather than the private sector or the army, which is traditionally thought to be uh, the stumbling blocks. And so Dr. Adil, if I can also have your views as well, uh, you know, what are the, the set of obstacles that you think tend to come, uh, you know, from India or also from the Pakistani side as well on this uh, issue? 
Okay, so we have this. So, well, currently the political environment between the two countries is not very conducive for trade, as Sanjay has already emphasized that. So the lackluster relationship between the two countries is, I guess, unlikely to create trading opportunities. Formal trading relationships often require uh, strong trade linkages, which can only be created once there's certainty amongst businesses that trading relationships between the two countries will remain normalized for a significant length of time. And the current scenario between the two countries does not provide that confidence to the businesses, right? So the political tension between Pakistan and India is, I guess, the largest obstacle to trade as the lack of confidence in creating sustainable trading relationships are likely to deter businesses from participating in cross-border trade activities. But with that said, even though trade between the two countries came to an abrupt halt in August 2019 after the Balakot and Pulwama crisis and the revocation of Article 370 by India, there were several challenges even when the two countries traded regularly in previous years. So imports into Pakistan from India did drop from 2 billion in 2014 to a meager 280 million in 2022. However, even before 2019, many significant challenges existed. Now, for instance, Pakistan had imposed a negative list on imports from India, which disallowed certain products, while it allowed only a limited list of 137 products that could be imported via the Wagha Atari border. These restrictions reduced cross-border trade. India's para-tariffs as well as non-tariff barriers created significant challenges for Pakistani businesses. For instance, India not only imposed certification requirements, but also the need to obtain Indian standard marks that often led to challenges for Pakistani businesses, particularly in the textile sector. It was difficult for Pakistani businesses uh, to access Indian labs for such certifications and obtain the standard marks. When such requirements exist, there also raises issues regarding the cumbersome processes, lack of transparency in awarding certifications, as well as the rec recognition of labs responsible for certifying the products. Now, even though many businesses in Pakistan were able to obtain certifications from developed countries such as the EU and the US, which are the largest export destinations for its finished products, access to lab certifying for exports to India was next to impossible and very costly for some businesses that were also able to meet those requirements. Add to this fact that selling products with made in India and made in Pakistan, labels in pa uh, India and Pakistan respectively, will always be challenging for the uh, respective businesses due to the prevailing mindset of the consumers. Right? Further, both countries now impose a sensitive list of products that reduces the amount of trade concessions in terms of lower tariff rates that could be offered to the exporters from the other country. For Pakistan, more than 20% of its imports from South Asia and 40% of its exports to South Asian countries falls in this sensitive list. India applies a longer sensitive list for Pakistan than it does for other neighbors as they're given concessions due to the development status or in the ambit of a free trade agreement as in the case of Sri Lanka. Even when trade was at its peak, Intra-regional trade in South Asia was much lower than the intra-regional trade within several other developing uh, regions. The uh, lack of connectivity between the two countries with limited air travel options and challenges in issuing visas has hurt the ability of businesses to generate trade linkages. Now, as Sanjay himself has mentioned in the World Bank report that it is much easier for Pakistan to trade with Brazil, which is more than 13,000 kilometers away than it is with next door India. So now, Doctor, yes, so now, uh, Dr. Sanjay, I want to draw your attention to a write-up that you actually did for Foreign Policy, which was titled, Pakistan's Missing Market, in which, if I have it correctly, your thesis statement was somehow uh, resuming trade with India as a chance to escape spiraling crises. Oh. So what, what was your uh, central crux, uh, or what was the message that, we, that you were trying to get out uh, through this write-up? Yeah, thank you. So, you know, we know that Pakistan has been going through crisis after crisis, right? It is probably the country that has gone more often to the IMF than any other. Uh, so, the, the most obvious thing is that the, is the Indian market, right? It is a massive dynamic market, the fastest growing large economy in the world, right? Uh, so the, the export possibilities are immense. If you extrapolate from the glass half full work that we did that Adil was referring to, extrapolate to the present in terms of uh, the trade data, just a simple extrapolation would show that uh, in 2022, Pakistan's exports uh, would have increased from 35 billion by a factor of almost uh, 80%, $25 billion dollar actually more than 80%, $25 billion uh, increase over the 31.5 billion. And that is, I'm talking only of goods, right? So the export possibilities 
Pakistan's recurring balance of pay payments problems, all of these would uh, receive a huge boost by uh, trading and exporting with India. But it doesn't stop there. And that's the case I was trying to make. Let's look at Pakistan's endemic problems, right? And I look at, I, I, I touched on three in my piece. Okay, let's start with the perhaps the biggest issue in, in Pakistan and in need for any uh, developing economy is inflation, right? Pakistan's inflation, as we know, the latest data for uh, December is showing 30% uh, inflation. It's been, you know, it's been 40%, 30%. And you know the uh, population has been quite miserable uh, trying to cope with this uh, with this kind of backbreaking inflation. Uh, now this is something that uh, uh, that trade addresses directly. This is the whole role of trade is arbitrage. You know where things are more expensive, you export. Where things are less expensive, I mean when things are more expensive, you import. And if you're competitive, you export. Right? That's trade. So I think and Pakistan is the one economy in South Asia whose poverty actually increased. Uh, last year, uh, again, this is World Bank study showing this in terms of number of people in poverty, again, because of inflation, because of the impact of uh, several other crises, which we know about, uh, global and local, right? So I think the first and most important thing is trade with India, for example, agricultural products, you know, we know that wheat, for example, has been spiraling, onions at some point were, so that all of this would have got addressed through trade and would have alleviated the problem uh, very significantly. Second issue in Pakistan is the competitive is competitiveness, right? The issue of entrenched industrialists, what everybody talks, rent seeking, the rent seeking sector. Now, if there is competitive pressure through imports from India, that and there is product, you know, that will add to competitive pressure, it will help improve productivity. But also it does a, an additional thing, Right, it also opens up the Indian market, and perhaps even the entrenched industrialists might be inclined to be a bit more generous if there is such a massive market out there. Uh, we India imports uh, close to eight hundred billion dollars worth of goods and services. Right, so if you're talking of that kind of a market next door, uh, then maybe even the industrialists would be inclined to be more generous and cede some space to uh, others who are trying to get into production. Right, so competitive pressure, the pulls of a of a massive uh, market right next to you, right? The power of uh, economic gravity. The third uh, issue which Pakistan's people are grappling with and suffering from is the energy crunch, right? Prices, uh, uh, some of the highest retail prices in the world for energy are in Pakistan, right? Despite all the investments that have been made in the sector in the last few years, right? So. This is again a no-brainer. In fact, in South Asia, we call energy trade a low-hanging fruit. India has significant surplus installed capacity in energy, which may be a surprise to many, but actually it is the case. Uh, India already exports energy to Nepal and to Bangladesh. Uh, there are immense possibilities in clean energy. Uh, there could be a solar partnership between India has already mooted a global so solar alliance and Pakistan could become a part of that. India exporting solar energy in time, Pakistan doing the reverse, exporting solar energy to India. And indeed, we can talk of hydropower possibilities where you have Central Asia power, you know, the so-called CASA, Central Asia, South Asia energy market, right? So clean energy, cheaper energy, and a more durable relationship arising from energy trade. So my point here was in the piece was that these are all organic grains arising from trade with India. And they're very important given how low the bar is currently, right? Even pre-2019, the trade was a fraction. Yeah, it was 10, 12% of its potential uh, compared to what it could have actually been. Therefore, all of these things that I pointed to are organic, and they can actually help improve uh, Pakistan's economy if it goes, goes to potential, the trading relationship. They can be all these secondary and very important gains for the Pakistan economy. Now, Dr. Sanjay, you've actually sketched a very promising picture of the Indian market itself. But for the Pakistani businesses that really want to have access to Indian market, uh, Dr. Adil, you certainly identified issues that actually exist on both sides. 
what can the two governments really do to actually help Pakistani businesses, you know, promising Pakistani businesses that actually want to uh, sell their products or export their products in the Indian market? Uh, okay. So firstly, one of the things that comes up is that uh, there is a, one of the things, issues that actually we face. And um, when we do this talk about uh, trade with Pakistan and India is that trade will be largely in benefit of India. The uh, India's, Pakistan is going to report another large um, deficit, which it does. So let me address that first, right? So one of the things about trade deficit is that a bilateral trade deficit by itself should not be considered an issue if a country can use the imports from a specific origin to improve its overall productivity levels and eventually increase its exports to other countries. So the overall trade deficit, though, should be tackled by increasing exports and not reducing imports. That's the other point. So, for instance, Pakistan may import a significant amount of cotton from India, which could be deemed essential for value added exports in the textile sector. With that said, increasing trade between the two countries will benefit the producers of goods needing specific in inputs from India, as well as the consumers of items commonly produced by India. Trade helps increase productivity levels as India is a larger economy and exports items essential for Pakistani consumers and industries, such as petroleum products, smartphones, and inputs for textile produ uh, production. The balance of trade is likely to be in favor of India. Now, as, as I mentioned earlier, restrictions on trade do end up inflating the overall trade deficit when they hurt productivity levels and export capabilities. Uh, many countries that have connected into regional and global value chains have benefited through increasing their own volume of exports. The inputs from India can help generate exports for Pakistan destined for more developed and advanced markets as well. On the other hand, Pakistan was an important source for specific products such as cement and dates in India. There have been several studies that have mentioned the potential of exports of finished textile products to India. It is again important to mention that the inability to create long-term sustainable trading relationships coupled with the high cost of trading is unlikely to encourage diversification in trade. Hence, the products will remain uh, limited to select few items and in trade is likely to remain much less than potential. Now to address this question of this uh, $37 billion in trade, right? So that was predicted at a time when trading relationship was comparatively normal. So in 2018, approximately 2 billion was imported from India into Pakistan with more than 870 million in cotton and organic chemicals. The rest were mainly pharmaceutical, uh, petrochemical uh, raw materials, textile spinning machineries and fabric dyes. These were intermediate goods or raw materials needed to produce finished goods in Pakistan. Currently, Pakistan is mostly importing organic chemicals and pharmaceutical products from India and that too in limited quantity. Exports from Pakistan to India virtually dropped to zero in 2018 when Pakistan exported about $400 million worth of goods to India. The top exports were again dates and cement. They contributed to almost $150 million of the total exports. Uh, now, in order to boost trade, it is imperative to ensure enough confidence in business across uh, borders to establish long-term trading relationships. This will only happen if the governments take confidence-building measures as was done in the late 1990s and during Musharraf's era. Unfortunately, several summits between Pakistan and India where agreements have been made to improve trading relationships have been followed by incidents that have severely marked the trading relationships. Although trading relationships have been mended after these uh, challenges, the current standoff is the longest in recent times, with little certainty that the relationship may improve in the near-term horizon. Now, considering that such measures to build confidence and normalize trade are renegotiated, it's essential to build the trade infrastructure, both digital and physical, that helps to foster trading relationships. Modern trade practices will involve converging not only in terms of standards and process of production and quality of goods, but also ensuring that the countries adopt the latest digital practices in trade and customs related facilitation to ensure maximum participation of businesses. Now, the uh, value of informal trade between Pakistan and India, while Dubai was estimated to be about $5 billion in 2012, more than twice the amount of formal trade. With no formal trade between the two countries today, this may have likely increased. However, there's little official statistics on such informal trade flows and calculations are mostly done in forms of estimations. India is now one of the largest exporters of refined oil in the world, while it is establishing itself as a dominant exporter of mobile phones. Now, both these commodities are typically imported to Pakistan from several different countries, and India can be a cheaper source for that. And then India also has a well-established pharmaceutical sector, which can again pro provide Pakistan with needed medicines. And that was the case during COVID-19 crisis. On the other hand, when trade relationships do normalize, Pakistan must consider re-establishing trade linkages in products such as cement and dates, as these products have already shown potential in India. 
Pakistan must also pursue uh, establishing linkages in the textile sector. Now, Pakistan was an important market for Indian cotton, which has now been replaced by the imports from the United States, which are far more expensive. So India is not only one of the cheapest cotton producers in the world, but also one of the largest producers after China. Cheaper raw material from India can help boost productive capabilities of the textile sector in Pakistan. This relationship should be established such that it encourages Pakistani finished products to be more readily available in India. The increase in participation in global value chains, as Pakistan primarily imports raw materials and intermediate goods, can help generate greater volume of exports, tackling the balance of payment crisis in Pakistan. Now, here, let me mention this, that although Pakistan was not in the top 25 export destination for India in 2018, the amount exported was not, was not much lower than what was exported to the top export destinations from India. With 2.3 billion worth of exports to Pakistan, the lowest within the top 25 export destinations of India reported about $4 billion worth of exports. As several studies suggest, Pakistan has the potential to become one of the top export markets for India if trade is to be normalized and obstacles reduced. Lack of trade hurts businesses in both countries. Even with all the restrictions and limitations imposed on trade, imports into Pakistan exceeded more than 2 billion. This peaks volume of potential once the trade relationship is normalized. Freer trade will benefit both countries. Now, Dr. Sanjay, if I can sort of rope you in on this as well, uh, you know, India-Pakistan bilateral trade at present is somewhere around 1 billion US dollars. And as per World Bank studies, which you uh, both gentlemen are aware of, uh, does suggest that the bilateral trade can be scaled up to 37 US billion dollars. Uh, what are some of the areas that you think both sides can also tap in, just as Dr. Adil alluded to some of them? Uh, that they can really tap in to, uh, you know, take up the bilateral trade to that level of potential. Right. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so when we did that study, when I was in the World Bank, that it was based on data for 2015. The report was produced in 2018. Current now trade since then has increased, uh, especially in India. So actually. 37 billion was the total trade potential in goods now but if you you know extrapolate that to current times you know that number will be significantly higher as i mentioned uh, you know earlier pakistan's export potential could be 25 billion and versus an estimate at that time of 18 billion right to india that and that's goods only so you know, I won't go into the details because Adil has already done that. Of some of the things that need to be done to actually achieve those kinds of volumes. I will just very quickly look at some big picture uh, possibilities uh, to just point to the potential, right? So, for example, uh, agriculture, right? So, the what the trade in agriculture, there is a lot of seasonal possibilities. Many studies have pointed, including our work. Uh, they can be trade in potatoes, onions, tomatoes, vegetables, fruits, uh, dry fruits, and so on. Uh, even wheat can be done on a controlled basis if necessary, uh, as would have, as was necessary last year, but didn't happen. Um, second uh, big area is energy trade, which I already talked about. Uh, it could happen on a starting from India to Pakistan, but in time happening both ways. Uh, again, seasonality, India, Nepal, there is seasonal energy trade, India exports energy to Nepal, but uh, in the summer, Nepal exports energy to India. In the winter, India exports energy to Nepal. So there is seasonality, the element of seasonality in energy trade, and with the two can be very complementary between cold and warmer uh, climates. Uh, the, then there is the issue of different kinds of value chains that can emerge, right? So in pharmaceuticals, India is a global leader. Pakistan has some strengths. There can be some synergies in pharmaceuticals, in textiles and garments already. We know Adil has already talked about cotton, but there's cotton, yarn, uh, fabrics, and you know, and the garments, the entire value chain of uh, textiles and garments. There are uh, immense possibilities of, uh, of trading, uh, creating value chains, trading within the components of that value chain, right? There is uh, some possibilities in automotive. Uh, there is uh, possibilities in, in religious tourism. Uh, a very a sliver of that is happening in the Kartarpur economic corridor, very small, uh, where Sikh, Sikh tourism is currently taking place from India uh, to Kartarpur Sahib. But that is a very small 
example of the possibilities that can happen. It can be Buddhist tourism, Sikh tourism, you know, Islamic tourism and so on. Medical services already, despite the uh, poor relations, uh, despite that, patients continue to come uh, from Pakistan to India. Again, the possibilities could be immense there in terms of medical tourism. And again, uh, telemedicine, given all that's happening on, on the digital front, which Adil also mentioned, there are possibilities on telemedicine, teleeducation, and so on and so forth, right? So I, I'm, I will stop here, but just giving you an example of the immense possibilities in different product areas were the relationship to normalize on trade. And it's very hard to predict the dynamic elements of trade, right? It's the, at the end, we are extrapolating, we're looking at examples, and but even our best estimates or our best uh, guesses will not be able to predict the possibilities and the dynamic uh, uh, gains that can accrue in sectors that you cannot even predict, you cannot think of. Were you, uh, uh, were you to allow entrepreneurial energies on both sides to be unleashed in a free manner? Yeah. And Dr. Sanjay, if I can, if I can uh, re-pitch the same question to you that I did to Dr. Adil as well. Uh, speaking of some of the bottlenecks that actually exist, you know, in terms of clearances or in terms of uh, acquiring certifications, what do you think can really be done on the Indian side uh, as well as on the Pakistani side to actually make some headway uh, on those areas? Well, I think, you know, uh, if there is a willingness, so those are uh, the next order. Once we assume trade uh, starts happening with some semblance of normalcy pre-2019, right? And I wouldn't call that normal trade in any sense, right? There were so many restrictions even pre-2019 as uh, Adil pointed out initially. Right, so uh, non-tariff barriers, certification. Now things are possible there. India is working with Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka to help their, for example, the laboratory infrastructure to re for recognition. For me, one can talk of mutual recognition agreements. Start with certain set of products where even if you have different standards, but both are acceptable, and your laboratory infrastructure is certified on you know certain labs are recognized in India. For example, in Bangladesh has recognized certain laboratories uh, which are deemed worthy of giving certification acceptable to Indian authorities. So I think there in each of these areas, where, for example, the Waga border restrictions, right? Uh, 138 products uh, that are only allowed. Now, uh, that creates roundabout trade via Karachi, via Dubai. Unnecessary, it's expensive. And there is no reason for that to continue in a normal trading situation. So there are many things that one needs to chip away at. But I think the first order of business is let's just resume trade and have a, get back to the negotiating table and start discussing how you get back to tariff-based trade, right? Not, you know, with the, all these kinds of restrictions uh, on the WAGA border or sensitive list. Or let's get back to pure tariff-based trade, and then we can start discussing how to go about reducing uh, our tariffs on both sides. There was, by the way, a blueprint ready for this in 2011. Uh, if uh, trade had been, uh, you know, if there were, and there was tremendous goodwill on both sides to make that happen, and there was a blueprint ready to be implemented. I said, what were the facets or, you, or, you know, the components of such a blueprint if it were to be made public or if it had to be concluded between the two sides. The components were basically to, uh, uh, you know, to start with uh, reducing the sensitive lists. And if Pakistan were to reduce, say, 100 products on the sensitive list, India would respond by reducing, you know, X times, I think the number was 600, but I may be wrong. But a factor, uh, an order of magnitude, far more uh, products on its sensitive list than, uh, than Pakistan would. Uh, that is the part of the early harvest that I spoke about. Uh, that can then lead to other things like, uh, you know, there, there were issues in visas, for, there were business visas, easing of business visas, right? Uh, especially, there was also visas for 65 plus, uh, uh, you know, people older than 65 not having to face as many restrictions. Uh, there were uh, discussions would, would have started on, you know, easing of the, you know, WAGA border restrictions on the number of products that uh, that are involved. 
<coughs> excuse me so all of these product I, my, my point here is that you unleash a set of dynamic possibilities by sitting on the negotiating table uh you know and then you agree that okay you know that we have possibilities and there will be a, a constructive approach on both sides and i do believe that india was ready to just once pakistan had started india would be ready to go the extra mile as it as it has done in all its relationship with uh, smaller economies like bangladesh or sri lanka or nepal right so the asymmetric element india recognizes that principle of asymmetric relationships and therefore would be willing to give Pakistan far more concessions than it would receive from Pakistan. And I, I don't believe that would have, that was not an issue and it was recognized in that uh, 2011 uh, uh, blueprint uh, for trade normalization. Now, Dr. Adil and Dr. Sanjay, let me uh, actually pick your brains on the, uh, the elephant in the room. And this is more about, uh, you know, the leadership uh, if we are really to uh, take things into a more desirable direction, if I am to say that, uh, what what do you really think in your individual capacity uh, is the kind of environment or the initiatives that uh, the leadership uh, can actually help create to make uh, things forward? Dr. Adil, you can go first. So I keep my answer short for this. Like I have covered a lot of suggestions in the previous uh, questions that you have asked. So. Pakistan and India have pursued confidence building measures, many of which have failed in providing substantial progress due to uncertainties and conflicts that have remained, right? So the most recent measure was the establishment of Kartarpur corridor. However, there was no impact on trading relationships between the two countries though. So the revocation of Article 370 has become a thorny issue and is likely to create challenges for normalizing trade in the near future. But that said, sporting events have often been used as an opportunity to establish better relationships, and we've seen that in history. Uh, the recent visit by the Pakistan cricket team, uh, despite all the challenges before and during the World Cup to India, can be considered a stepping stone to improve uh, cricketing ties between the two countries. Now, again, all eyes are on the Indian cricket team to reciprocate for the Champions Trophy in 2025, and I think that will be very crucial to, again, re-establish uh, relationships. Uh, so once trading relationships do improve, the governments must seek to establish regular trading events at or near the border check posts to ensure that local communities participate in trading activities and become more involved with the trading process. The border hats uh, at Bangladesh-India border are an example as stated by Sanjay in his report. There have been uh, recent calls to open such markets along the line of control. It is believed that more than 4,000 families which were involved in trade were impacted by the closure of the border since tensions escalated in 2019. Trading relationships can improve with the realization of the that the potential gains from trade are higher than the gains from limiting it by governments on both sides. For instance, Pakistan can provide land access to Central Asia and Middle East to Indian traders. It is estimated that India's trade with the Central Asian region can increase five to ten times its current levels if India gets better uh, better access over the land route from Pakistan. Similarly, land route access to Iran and Turkey via Pakistan can also benefit Indian traders. Further air linkages between different uh, major cities across the subcontinent could enhance to it could be enhanced to improve not only trade linkages but greater people to people contacts. Uh, there used to be regular flights between Karachi and Mumbai for many years, regardless of the type of relationship between the two largest countries in the, in South Asia. And unfortunately, South Asia has become less connected, and it's likely to its own detriment. So, as a and yes, doctor. This is a, a, a very important question. Um, you talked about the environment or initiatives from the leadership. Um, I think that um, <clears throat> to begin with, it requires statesmanship and uh, uh, a willingness on the leadership to uh, leadership's part to look at the people's core interests, right? Uh, on the Indian side, for example, we would like that it not become relations with Pakistan, uh, trade relations with Pakistan should not become an election issue, uh, which of course is now possible after the general elections. Uh, and also to make, you know, to look at the big picture, the opportunity costs of non-cooperation, right? This is, this is massive. Um, you know, we had air pollution, you know, both Lahore and New Delhi suffered the same air pollution. And, you know, the air does not respect borders. Similarly, the looming water crisis, 
in in um, in south asia and pakistan and india parts of india are going to be very se severely affected there's disaster risk management all of these these are areas where non cooperation can be catastrophic uh, for for both countries and more south asia more broadly right then there is all the costs of non trading which we have already discussed but the the the, the costs are billions of dollars of uh, trade and lacks of uh, good jobs that are for, foregone the suffering in the borderland economies right so all the economies suffering all the people who have jobs specifically catering to border trade to the uh, goods that uh, goods that flow across the borders those people are directly affected right uh, for pakistan's on its part the same set of issues but i think the uh, the gains for pakistan are simply massive right so i think uh, for pakistan i believe the leadership that is required is needs to set the stage uh, uh, by having internal conversations uh, within pakistan about the need for this so that when it is if and when trade with india is announced it does not become uh, a surprise or a political issue as it happened uh, you know uh, a year or so year a year and a half ago when mm -hmm. there was some talk of uh, resuming trade but then it became uh, a, a political issue and then you know pakistan had to uh, uh, step back from from that so i think uh, setting the stage on both sides uh, having these internal conversations so that then you can make the big big announcements and you know we can speak speak more to more to this and dr sanjay and dr adil if both sides were to uh, collaborate with each other in the services sector uh wh what jobs do you really see opening up uh in these areas uh, both in india and both in pakistan dr sanjay we can start with you and then we can go to uh, dr adil as well yeah so i i think i already mentioned that uh, you know in you know the the work that we did when i was in the world bank all those extrapolations on trade being 37 billion and all of that that was all restricted to goods only and that's why i always say that uh, that estimate is a uh, is a huge underestimate because it doesn't include uh, the services sector and and of course it was based on earlier data so i gave you some examples and there are simple ones the ones i gave for example religious tourism medical tourism medical services telemedicine and so on right so that's and you know uh, people coming across to each other for accessing services and so on so that's just the obvious stuff there is much more that can happen also in addition in the productive sector right in services that are the back services we know are the backbone of the economy uh, whether it is logistics whether it is productivity productivity enhancement through digitization we call it actually in economist jargon we call it serviceification of the economy right in other words more and more of the productive sector is in one way or the other getting uh, in influenced and dominated even manufacturing has having a bigger and bigger component of the services sector so to the extent that the services sector is inefficient right in both economies but let me take an example let's say of uh, logistics in pakistan or banking services in pakistan if they were to allow and if indian firms could invest in the logistics sector or in the banking sector right those improvements in the productive uh, efficiency of the these pakistani services would in turn help pakistani exports of both services and manufacturers right so i think the possibilities are very large uh, uh, and you know i don't have numbers on the services sector perhaps uh, adil does but i i just believe that it is uh, it is something that is on an order of magnitude uh, which could and one day be on par with goods and perhaps in time even scale that and dr adil if i can have your thoughts also so so india's total services sector exports like i think exceed 320 billion in 2022 right one was dominated by the it services uh its service ex uh, sector export grew by 25% i guess in the last uh, fiscal year and the ict sector contributed about 180 billion with it services reported more than 100 billion 
right? And total exports. So India is the second largest exporter of ICT services followed by Ireland. It's large skilled uh, workforce coupled with a large English speaking population provides it much potential a lot of which it has already tapped into, right? So in recent years, Pakistan too has made a push to increase its exports in the ICT sector. It reported more than 2.6 billion in export revenue in 2022, uh, up from 1 billion in 2018. Pakistan may have only 0.3% of total global share in IT services exports, but this share has grown in the last few years as we have seen a lot of successful uh, stories in the IT ICT sector. And this is expected to increase beyond $3 billion in this year. Uh, Pakistan startup scene posted excellent results in late 2021 and 2022. This did nose dive in 2023 as funds dried up with increasing economic challenges. However, this has improved in late 2023 as exports not only recovered, but there were some new news of more investments in startups. The IT sector is one of the most vibrant sector in Pakistan, and several experts believe it has significant potential in boosting its uh, export revenue. Now, the IT sector involves transfer of knowledge and technology across borders. Even though Pakistani firms may not have direct relationships with Indian firms, the technological advancement and development often requires collaboration between firms in different countries. Pakistani and Indian computer engineers often collaborate in third countries as both countries have similar demographics. It's likely that IT companies and startups take advantage of experiences of firms regardless of their location. For instance, e-commerce companies such as Daraz has presence across the South Asian region, while many foreign entities have presence in both India and Pakistan. The collaboration, though, should not be limited to the ICT sector, IT sector. Religious tourism is a major sector where there's potential collaboration. Pakistan has numerous sites that are significant for Hinduism, Sikhism, Buddhism, and other religions. For instance, the recently established Kartarpur corridor at the border with India features a visa-free crossing for Indians. Many such sites significant to Sikhism exist in Pakistan. Similarly, Pakistan has several temples important to Hinduism across the country and can attract many uh, pilgrims. On the other hand, India is known for its Islamic heritage and has several sites with historical significance. There's indeed significant benefit uh, from collaboration in such tourism. Then we have uh, uh, the entertainment sector, which includes not only movies, but cricket, which can offer several op uh, options of collaboration. Several Pakistani stars have appeared in Indian movies and vice versa. Several Indian movies have generated significant revenue in Pakistan. Pakistani cinema owners complain about the dearth of Pakistani movies, which makes them uncompetitive. And greater the number of movies shown in Pakistan, greater the likely competition for quality output and consequently the demand for more entertainment, entertaining Pakistani movies. Now, for instance, Sanju and Sultan made more than 5% of the total revenue from Pakistani cinemas. While uh, during the same period, few Pakistani movies were released that also performed, uh, performed relatively well in Pakistan. Now, according to some estimates, Pakistan was the third largest market for Indian films when movies were regularly, regularly released in Pakistan. Also, it is important to consider that Indian movies are quite popular on Netflix in Pakistan and that Z Zindagi showed several Pakistani dramas which are popular in India. Pakistan and India cricket matches are considered high voltage games, get record viewerships and uh, generate substantial revenue for the host countries wherever they played. Finally, there's significant potential in collaboration in the transportation sector, as I had said earlier. If Pakistan is to become a crossroad between South Asia and Central Asia, the transportation and travel services in Pakistan will have to be developed in order to facilitate the influx of not only tourists, but also the goods that transit through the country. Sanjay, I actually have a late question. You know, at Infer, we've actually been uh, doing a lot of content where we've uh, tried to highlight how Pakistani content has gained a lot of traction in India over the ages and over the decades. Uh, but speaking of cricket and entertainment itself, what do you think can be done in India, uh, you know, off lately to allow for that kind of cultural exchange, that kind of exchange in domain of sport itself? Uh, what do you think can really be done? Well, I think, uh, you know, it was not so long ago uh, that uh, there was uh, very free and open uh, exchanges happening, especially in the entertainment sector, as Adil has pointed out. Very true. Uh, and, you know, I think it uh, it can, uh, cricket seems to be more politicized, but again, I see absolutely no reason there are very heartwarming stories of uh, when Indian teams visiting Pakistan and when Pakistan teams visiting India about the kind of re reception and the hospitality both sides have with which the teams have been treated or indeed uh, 
common citizens of each other, you know, countries have been treated across the borders. Um, so I think there are uh, the possibilities that, you know, these are very, these are kind of high profile things, you know, cricket and entertainment, which kind of tend to be a casualty or even, for example, literary festivals, music festivals, these kind of less, less high profile, uh, but then, then, then cricket and films. So these tend to become casualties of the, the political uh, uh, atmosphere rather than it being the other way around, actually. Uh, these could, we, we could say that, why don't these continue irrespective of the political situation? Because these are people-to-people -people exchanges at the end of the day. And these have a possibility of creating openings, creating goodwill, and, and opening up in other spaces. Uh, unfortunately, these are politicized, but I believe, you know, learning from our own past history between the two countries, uh, they, we can go back to those kinds of situations should certain things happen, uh, you know, and and those certain things are, I, I think, are the critical things. How can you, how can you get back to an atmosphere resembling some kind of normalcy where I think, where, you know, I think trade has to really show the way. Now, gentlemen, let's reimagine a different future. If we were to have Pakistan to allow India to have access to Central Asian markets and to have India to allow Pakistan access to, you know, the adjacent neighborhoods, say Bangladesh, Nepal, and other places, uh, what kind of opportunities do you foresee uh, get created as a consequence of this action? Um, uh, so, I think... Uh, the I don't know whether we have uh, Ardil actually spoke of a number, uh, you know, several times India's trade with Central Asia, for example. Uh, I think the again the possibilities are very large because these are dynamic situations, right? But I, let me give you some just uh, examples. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, for example, <clears throat> let's say there is a transit trade happening, right? Uh, opening up of this market transit trade happening on both sides, right? So you will have vehicles, uh, you will have trains, you will have, say, boats and ships, you know, uh, because it will be multimodal trade in an ideal sense. So you will have, you will need to service these uh, these equipment that will plying all these routes. Secondly, you will need to serve the operators who are plying this equipment, right? These trains, boats, and vehicles. So you will have jobs in hospitality, you will have jobs in accommodation, food, the entertainment sector, all of this will be needed, right, to accommodate, uh, ac ac accommodate this. If, assuming there's these kinds of routes open up, right, so, for example, uh, Delhi to Kabul and beyond, or, you know, uh, from Peshawar to Delhi to Dhaka to Kathmandu and beyond, right, these, if these kinds of routes open up, you can easily foresee new jobs coming up in the productive sector to cater to these newly efficient, these more efficient routes that are coming up, which will probably displace some less efficient routes that are on those sectors, right? So you will you can open up competitiveness of especially those nodes that are linked to these kinds of corridors uh, if, if they and when they do come up, right? So there, there will be jobs in the productive sector. This can be done for good straight, as we mentioned, and it can also be done exactly the same thing can happen in energy trade, right? Where you have, where I talked about Central Asia, South Asia, the CASA, the Central Asia, South Asia trade, where you have, a, a, you know, when I was in the World Bank and they still do talk about CASA REM, Central Asia, South Asia, regional energy market, which linking South Asia, uh, Central Asia's hydropower with Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, and the rest of, uh, you know, South Asia. and Along with then on the other side, you know, I mentioned the solar uh, energy that's becoming increasingly big uh, um, in this part of the world and everywhere else. So we're talking lacks of possibilities of new jobs coming up here. If successful, we're talking multiples of that, right? So it's even hard to get wrap your head around the kinds of things that are that will be possible. But I think the the possibilities are exciting and and uh, immense. And Dr. Adil, if I can have your thoughts on the same question as well. Well, so I think one of the best ways to begin this conversation on increasing trade, right, is to have these regular seminars 
where between different stakeholders and experts and business leaders so that the parties involved discuss what is at stake and bring about ideas of collaboration, right? So that once relationships do uh, move towards normalization, we see faster results on the ground as Sanjay has mentioned. When trade was normalized, the discussion to increase trade relationships and seminars were also more common. So we saw this a lot. There was a lot of trend of a lot of discussions on how uh, to improve trading relationships. And that was being done earlier in the previous decade, right, when we used to trade more. But now it has become, well, this discussion has almost become like non-existent, right, because there is very little interaction. Uh, I myself first interacted with Sanjay when I worked on a Pakistan-India trade-related project, uh, which was on the textile sector uh, about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, so here it is important to point out, now the last time the commerce ministers of the two countries met was in January 2015, this was bilateral, when normalization of trade relationship was discussed, how the uh, relationship then took a downward turn since uh, then. It is more likely that government officials will meet in sidelines of multilateral organizational meetings such as SCO rather than have bilateral meetings and that's what, so there is very little discussion even amongst the top government office, uh, officials and all that going on so normalization seems to be like, uh, well, that uh, is always going to be a challenge. So apart from such seminars and sports and cultural exchange between the two countries, which are, uh, we have we have icebreakers, right, we have the the cricket, which is a good example. And then we expect India to reciprocate for the uh, for the upcoming Champions Trophy next year, and that will also uh, build bridges there. So other sporting events between the two countries provide an opportunity to increase collaboration. We see a lot of other sporting events and music festivals, etc., and literary festivals going on, uh, which uh, between collaboration between India and Pakistani singers and uh, people experts, etc., right in different fields. So they, again, help build relationships as well as they help improve trade relationships. Televised events, right, often help portray the different brands in the countries where games are viewed, linking the audience with the businesses there. Markets at the border, again, can also play a very important role to kickstart the trading relationship. And then there's a film and TV industry, again, which we have talked about. Uh, the collaboration there has been... Uh, uh, very important. Then finally, as uh, there is, uh, there will also be this this whole CPEC, right, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Once that corridor is fully established, there is always this thing, how do you expand and get more countries involved in South Asia into that corridor, right? Pakistan, like if it becomes the transit hub in the region, then it will have to have uh, bigger, better collaboration with Indian firms, Indian traders who can use that corridor. So that is all there, right? So we have uh, a lot of opportunities uh, and a lot of uh, possibilities are there, but unfortunately we just have to start thinking about them again, right? Start from zero. But we've had historical, uh, like the experience we do collaborate and all that was there 10 years ago. So I think, we just have to build up on that and see what worked and what did not work and uh, use that experience to improve our. So that's the thing. We need to have more such discussions and have more ideas on collaboration between the experts. Once we get the opportunity, we are ready for it. Yeah. Now, Dr. Adil and Dr. Sanjay, before we wrap up this conversation, we know the situation is not so ideal between the two countries. But if we were to think out of the box, be more creative, and suggest two to three things that you think each country can do to help slowly build things uh, up the ladder uh, in terms of resuming bilateral trade with each other. Yeah, so I think Adil has uh, just uh, has answered that question, I think. Uh, and let me build on what he has said. Uh, uh, and I'm sure he may want to add something, but uh, you know he's already uh, taken a big shot at, at that question. So. I, what I would like to do is separate the how, how we do it, and the, se the second part is will it happen, right? Uh, so let's start with <clears throat> the fact is that the way the dynamics are currently, where do we see what, what is happening? I think there needs to be some face saving, a little bit of face saving for Pakistan, especially because it has boxed itself into a position about Article 370 and Jammu and Kashmir and all of that. So I think if there can be some, some element there, so for example, in India, if it can be the statehood of Jammu and Kashmir, if it is given statehood, that provides possibility of an opening uh, to, to Pakistan for face saving. But another element could be there is that get some essential items from India, right? So you say, okay, well, 
we have wheat is in huge short supply. I mean, you know, that could have been, I was thinking last year, that certainly could have happened because with the prices of wheat, if I'm not mistaken, at some point there was inflation rate and wheat was touching 170%, right? Uh, there could have been a request uh, at that time in the name of the people of Pakistan who were suffering uh, to say, can we get some emergency wheat imports from India? Under those kinds of... So that could have been an icebreaker. What we need are icebreakers, right? So uh, <clears throat> the back channels, of course, uh, those hopefully are continuing. We need those to continue. Um, uh, I agree with Adil on all the things that the people-to-people -people ele elements... Uh, the, the border markets, the seminars and all of that, uh, building on our, you know, being ready when when things come up, uh, when, when there is a demand uh, from the po political side uh, to start quickly. But the question would it <clears throat> would be that, uh, would the army give space in, in Pakistan? And I, and I, you already, I already mentioned at the start, I do think that the army, given Pakistan's economic situation, I think the army is certainly willing to uh, agree to uh, a, a dialogue on, on trade. Uh, can the, and we know that we're going to have new governments, uh, you know, elections February in Pakistan, and hopefully, I don't know whether it's actually going to happen, but at least that's slated. Uh, when there are new uh, regimes, new governments, maybe not necessarily new regimes, New, uh, uh, new dispensations in place on both sides. Can the new government in Pakistan agree? And can the army agree that uh, that India trade is in Pakistan's overwhelming interest? Right. Uh, my, I think that Pakistan should push India, uh, uh, should push trade with India inside uh, within Pakistan, even unilaterally. This is the point of the of the piece that I wrote. Given how big uh, the high the benefits are for Pakistan, I believe that Pakistan should unilaterally uh, uh, open uh, open up to trade with India. Um, it's currently uh, technically it's a ban, although they do allow there's some medicines, essential stuff still goes uh, because the costs are very high and are non-sustainable. Uh, on the Indian side, I think the Indian uh, gains are certainly not trivial. Uh, Adil mentioned it earlier. And, uh, you know, Bangladesh is the fifth largest export market for India today, right? Pakistan could conceivably be as big, if not bigger, uh, in the long run, right? So it's not trivial at all, the, the Pakistani market. So, and the long-term gains to India of opening up with Pakistan are even bigger. Imagine the gains of a, of a quiet border. It's a, it's, those are massive uh, geopolitical gains for India. So India should be if Pakistan were to move this, may have make a move on trade, India should be generous and very constructive in its response to that because it is not doing it for, let's say, even in the minds of politicians, it's not doing it for Pakistan's sake. It's doing it for its own sake, right? So I think mutual self-interest is there in this. And we, I think, I hope uh, what Adila and I have said has at least uh, convince some people that the mutual self-interest is is so high, the stakes for Pakistan are so high, the stakes for India are not small by any means. Uh, I think th this needs to happen. Will it? The question is, will it? I do believe the elections will provide an opportunity, uh, and and with with some even some uh, nominal face-saving gestures, uh, I think uh, we can hopefully look forward to in this year, in 2024, uh, to uh, a different era, going back to at least uh, pre-2019, and then using that as the springboard for a much more constructive and deeper uh, trading and trading goods, services, people-to-people -people kind of relation. And Dr. Sanjay, just a point of clarification, when you say elections, you're also alluding to election year. Uh, since we have an election year in India as well, you're also speaking about uh, elections in India as well. Very much. I, you know, uh, pre-elections, you know, uh, these can be a uh, trade with Pakistan can become an election issue that you're being soft on Pakistan because of, uh, you know, and so the uh, opposition parties or can can sort of pick that up. But elections are happening. Uh, let's say in April. I don't, you know, date has hasn't been announced. But we expect a new 
uh, government to be in place in March, in, in May. After that, that, you know, for the next five years, at least in the initial years of a democratic government, those uh, cease to become as important, right? Pre-elections, these things are always hyped up. So my point is here, there is a window immediately after an election in both sides, but certainly in, 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 in India after May, hopefully in Pakistan soon, uh, that, that I think th those are opportunities we should not miss because those are the best opportunities where uh, politics is the least dominant because then gov new governments, they want to get on with the business of governing, right? So that's the opportunity strike mm -hmm. when that, that, that opportunity uh, allows itself. Right, and before we wrap up, Dr. Adil, if we can have your thoughts as well. Uh, so I think uh, Sanjay has covered a lot of uh, things in this in his talk. So one thing that I would put in is that we should go for the low hanging fruits first. What are the low hanging fruits, right? We have, so there is this whole talk about uh, Pakistan getting a major cricket uh, event right next year. And one of the contentions there is, is India going to visit us? Now that should be there. Like if India wants to improve relationships, it has to uh, come for the Champions Trophy in 2025. Now that will again set a whole new relationship paradigm in that, that we will be able to then build up on that. So cricket does play an important, uh, it is a high stake thing that it does play a big role in eventually setting up our relationship. Then the next is about like Pakistan is building, trying to build one of this uh, uh, well infrastructure development and all that. And with PMLN coming in, uh, if it does, uh, we may have that, uh, uh, there are more development in the infrastructure there, right? So there could be that that linking South Asia could be a big topic there. How do we get it more integrated into South Asia? Because India has also shown that it wants to become more linked to Middle East, right? With its own infrastructure development projects and then onwards to Europe. So there's this whole land route, which makes trading a lot cheaper. It's much more easier to trade over land, right? With one mode, uh, having train connections and by road or et cetera. Then it could be with other modes, right? So we could always have that debate about how to integrate this whole uh, relationship. And then third, I guess, uh, again, the final point, I think even Sanjay had that was that there has to be a change in mindset, right? Again, for uh, in both countries, the government of both countries need to do that. I think there is a lot of rhetoric that was done. It was not in favor of trade in the last five years, and that needs to change. So even there will be both. We have elections in Pakistan and in India, and hopefully we are looking at times when uh, this whole discussion will change and improve towards the chance where we're actually talking about normalizing trade rather than ha just rather than starting it, right? Uh, so that's Dr. Adil and Dr. Sanjay. Thank you for joining us for this conversation today. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for thank you for very inviting much. us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for joining us for this conversation with Dr. Adil and Dr. Sanjay. Our team works very hard to make this work possible. And it would mean the world to us if you could like and share our content. And if you'd like to stay informed about our upcoming podcasts and other work, please hit the bell icon.